This is the 26th video in the video series of Orbital Mechanics with Python. This one, I'm going to be going over the universal variable solution to Lambert's problem. And I said in the last video, what Lambert's problem is, is when you have two position vectors in a time of flight, and you want to find a Keplerian orbit that fits with those two vectors. And this is a boundary value problem because you know some states at the beginning time and some states at the final time. Whereas, say, for the initial value problem of propagating orbits, you have all the states at the initial time. And there's 3D and 2D components because a Keplerian orbit is by definition 2D since there's no perturbations, but it's in 3D space. So it's kind of two different um, aspects of that where when you're solving the Lambert's problem, it's actually a 2D problem. And one more thing uh, about the geometry of this here is that there's kind of in, in with these initial conditions or not initial conditions, but con um, boundary value conditions that you have, there could be two solutions because there could be one solution like this one where the true anomaly between these two vectors is less than 180 degrees. So you could imagine what this angle is here of this triangle. But there's also another solution where the true anomaly is greater than 180 degrees. So it'd be if you're going from here, R0, and then going around the long way uh, this way. So that, that would give a true anomaly between the vectors that's greater than 180 degrees. And I'll show where that's implemented in the actual method. So I found this good paper, um, it's on the internet, I'll put a link in the description, just talking about Lambert universe, Universal Variable Algorithm uh, by some people from Saudi Arabia and Egypt. So basically they do a good job of going through everything, kind of explaining all the math that's going behind it, because that's the more difficult part and more complex part about Lambert's problem is the actual math that's going into it, whereas actually implementing it in software is pretty straightforward. It's just an algorithm that you plug in. Uh, so I'm not going to be going over their math. Um, I'm going to post a link to this and also other sources that I found that do a good job of explaining that math if that if you want to know more. So I'm not going to go over it because again, they would do a better job than I would of explaining it anyway. But the one thing I want I do want to go over over in their math is that this universal variable uh, usually denoted by the capital letter chi here is a new independent variable, a kind of generalized anomaly. And as it says here, so when, when you use chi as the independent variable in this problem instead of time itself, the nonlinear equations of motion can be converted into linear constant coefficient differential equations, which is a whole motivation behind what's going on here. So basically this chi variable you think of as analogous to time, and you'll see how that's important in the actual algorithm, uh, which is an iterative algorithm in order to find out what this chi value is that corresponds to whatever time that you have, that's transfer time. Um, and this is how it can be calculated, uh, where E is elliptic e eccentric anomaly, and then H is a hyperbolic eccentric anomaly, where they have different definitions. Um, so yeah, there's that, but you don't have to worry about that equation at all. Uh, you'll just It just comes back in the actual algorithm, where I'm just going to explain kind of high level conceptually what the algorithm is doing and why it's an iterative process, but then I'm kind of just going to show the algorithm side by side with the way I have it in Python, because realistically they look very similar because that's just the nice way of how Python is written. Um, so here, uh, this, is, this is your inputs into the algorithm. You have your initial position vector, your final position vector, and then some sort of delta t. And then some other values that you have are some initial an initial value for this psi that will be introduced in the algorithm, an upper value for it, um, and a lower value where you're kind of you're trying to converge this psi value in order for the chi variable to converge with the actual transfer time that you give this delta t, and this tm value where it's uh, the value of one for short wave transfers and negative one for long wave, like I said. M is just a max amount of steps to see if you're going to converge or not. And then tolerance is the tolerance you want to get um, to have this chi value equate to this other um, time variable to see if they match up to within some tolerance, where I have it as the default value is 10 to the negative 6, uh, but you can have it for more if you need to. And then mu, whereas mu is just a gravitational parameter of the central body like usual. So here's a computational sequence. I'm going to skip really quickly to the iterative part, which starts here at step 7. Uh, for i um, for i equals 1 to m, so m is just an arbitrary max number of steps where if you say if it reached m steps then it's probably not going to converge and get out of the algorithm and say you didn't solve it. So the whole goal and how you get out of this algorithm, how you converge, is if the delta t, which is the delta t that's being input, uh, the difference between that and then this other delta t with the tilde variable um, is less than tolerance. So if they're within each other by, say, 10 to the negative 6, then say you've converged and then get out of the iterative scheme, where this uh, delta t with a tilde variable right here is dependent on mu, the chi uh, variable, c3, which I'll get to, 
uh, where and also chi is dependent on C2 and B is also dependent on C2 and C3. Um, so I'm actually going to show as well the C2 and C3 functions. They, in this paper, they have it implemented differently than some other ways that I've seen. Um, so I'll show, this is one way of implementing the C2 and C3 functions. Uh, this is from Polyostro. I'll post a link in the description of, of uh, this because it, this is another um, Python library that does astrodynamics, orbital mechanics type stuff. So it's interesting. Um, but this is the equation that they have in their implementation. So stump F C2, uh, where it's just this, it's just a simple trigonometry right here, and then C3. And I've also seen it implemented another way. So this is from MathWorks, the people who make MATLAB, uh, their website where they, this is their stump F function, which is um, an, in, an iterative way uh, to calculating the C2, C3, and C1 values, which aren't used in this context, but are in other contexts. Uh, so they do it in an iterative way, um, but where they state here that this is actually, you know, the equations of what's actually happening, they're just calculating it in a different way. So I just want to show those two, um, and I'm going to be using uh, this version, just because it's simpler for you to see kind of what's going on, that it's just a little bit of trig. Um, but yeah, so they have that in the paper, which again, you can read if you'd like. But the whole point is that you're trying to get this chi value, or you're trying to get this delta t tilde value to get cl as close as possible to the actual true delta t that you're looking for, and that's what you're trying to iterate upon. So I hope that gives kind of a, a high level kind of contextual of what this algorithm is trying to do. And then here, I'm just going to, again, I'm just going to put it side by side with the way I have it implemented in Python, because again, it's just straightforward. And the complexity of this comes from the math, not the actual implementation, because the implementation is pretty straightforward. So uh, it's just a function where I have a different Lambert's tool file, just like I have a Spice tools file and other tools file. I just made a Lambert's tools file just so that tools file doesn't get too big and kind of separate the different kind of tools that you have. So the inputs are initial position vector, final position vector, and delta t, which is that is the classic what you need for a Lambert's problem. And this tm value, I set it to 1 just as default, but you can make it negative 1 to go the long way. And again, mu is important here, so you need to make sure you have the mu value. Uh, the tolerance here for that tolerance for this delta t tilde uh, variable here. Uh, max steps, again, this is an arbitrary number, just to say if it reads 200 steps, it probably isn't going to converge. And then an initial guess for psi, um, and uh, an upper boundary for psi, whoops, upper boundary for psi and a lower boundary for psi, whoops, it keeps happening, which again, they have at the top here. So what you need is an initial value for psi, an upper value for psi, and a lower value for psi. And again, this is really just straightforward implementation um, after you kind of get the math behind it and also conceptually what you're trying to do in this algorithm. So I'm not really going to talk too much about it because they're kind of just side by side, um, kind of just exactly lined up. I followed their um, algorithm exactly with what I was doing, so R norm. Uh, the norm of the position vectors, this gamma variable, we have a dot product here. Um, oh yeah, th this this is what a dot product looks like. It's the sum of the corresponding parts of vectors. When, when you have a vector dot product, that's what a dot product is. Um, so that's the same thing. This beta parameter, tm, gamma, and all this. Again, I'm not really going to talk too much through it because I'm just showing you kind of the parallels of how I implemented in Python from their um, algorithm. So I'll just scroll down as this is going. So the for loop starts here. Check for these. So when it says uh, readjust psi lower until b is greater than zero, I just, um, what I did is I just said increase psi lower by pi and then just flip the sign of the b parameter because this will happen if b is less than zero, so then you make it positive. Um, that's just something I did. You could do that a different way, but I just found that this worked. I still converged on everything, so that's totally fine. And then for this chi value, I actually have it cubed, uh, so I can plug it in here, cubed. Um, this is something I wanted to do that they don't have in this algorithm, but it, it all gets you to the same place. So here's where the, you make the comparisons of the absolute value of the delta t versus delta t. Um, I represent the tilde just as an extra underscore here. So that's less, uh, solve it equals true, and break out of the for loop. Um, if it's not, then readjust the upper psi value. Uh, to be what the previous psi value was. So you're kind of just trying to converge on a psi value here that will get you to converge um, with that delta t tilde uh, variable. And then, so at the at the end of each loop, uh, you're just going to readjust your psi value and then you're going to recalculate C2 and C3. Where the C2 and C3, again, I'm just using the polyastro implementation of it. 
uh, just rewritten, super simple, just trig here. Uh, yeah, just trig, and then you can take a look back in the video just to see how, I mean, this is just basically their equations, I'm just putting them here. Oh, actually, this should be math, because math is faster than the numpad version of square root. So that's C2 and C3, uh, adjust those. So then if you get out of the loop and it's not solved, so if it got past the number of steps, just say it didn't solve. And the reason I return zeros is because the way I have it implemented um, uh, in the pork chop plots, it's convenient to have it return zeros instead of erroring um, because there's a lot of times where it won't converge when you're doing a pork chop plot. So then after uh, you converge in some value, uh, you, calc you can calculate um, these f, g, and g dot, which again, I'm not going to go into the math of them, but the paper does as to what they are. And then from that, you can find the derivatives. So this x dot zero, y dot zero, I'm going to make this bigger for a second. x dot zero, y dot zero, and z dot zero, which is just a derivative um, of the initial position vector, which is the velocity. Uh, so that's that is. And then the same thing with x uh, is just the final vector, uh, where you have x dot, y dot, z dot, which is the derivatives of them and the algorithm's over, so you found it. So that's basically what I'm doing. C calculate these f, g, and g dot, and then calculate the velocity vectors and return the velocity vectors. So that's pretty much what the algorithm is. So then how you can use it in a script. So I have a script here uh, that where you can do an Earth to Venus transfer. Uh, so again, all the standard imports as usual. You have an initial time and a final time, which is actually important. I chose just a 90-day transfer for Venus. Uh, you have your frame. Uh, I'm using the ecliptic. Again, uh, that's usually what's used when you're looking at the solar system, where you have the sun as the observer, and then header file, don't worry about this, just outputting a CSV file. So when you want to furnish the solar system kernel because you want to get the position, the ephemeris data of Earth and Venus. Uh, you want to get your initial time and final time in seconds past J2000 uh, using the spice function. Uh, calculate the transfer time from that. Uh, make a time array uh, to get ephemeris data for Earth and Venus. Um, this is the spice tools file uh, that I've shown before here, the get ephemeris data function. Uh, so the initial position vector is going to be the initial position of Earth, so states of Earth, the first state, and then 0, 1, 2, which is a position vector, and the final one, oh, actually, I changed this, so you don't even need this line. So then RF, again, the, the final, the second position vector that you're going to have is Venus at the last time step and 0, 1, 2, which is a position vector. And then from there, you can call the Lambert's universal variables over LT. I call Lambert's tools that import at the top. So you have initial vector, final vector, transfer time. And you want to make sure the mu value in this case is the sun's mu value and not the Earth's. And then, so I'm going to propagate the orbit of the spacecraft. So once we have this initial velocity, we can get the state, uh, the initial state is just the initial position and the initial velocity. And then propagate orbit, pretty simple, just with orbit propagator, uh, where the central body is the sun and not the Earth. And then plot and orbits together, uh, which I've shown before. So then the results of that look like this, where it's just a transfer from Earth uh, to Venus. So here we start out, this is the initial position over here. Um, we have the spacecraft and Earth in the same place. And then the final position over here is when it catches up to Venus down there. And then I also have a GIF version of this that I showed in the last video, but I can just show it again. And again, I'm going to cover how to make these GIFs. Um, it's going to take a few videos, but it's kind of nice just to have this tool so then you can have some nice visualizations. But this is what the 90-day transfer looks like. Uh, I'll just play it. let it play one more time. And yeah, that's pretty much it for uh, this video. Went over that, went over the 90 day Earth to Venus transfer. Uh, yeah, and that's it for this video. In the next video, I'm actually going to make a video zero. This is about almost a year and a half after I made the first video, and I've learned a bunch of things um, of ways to make the video series better and kind of just give you better information and just kind of the way that the series should work, which I'm going to make a video about that and include a bunch more uh, cool visualizations. So yeah, that's it for this video. Uh, just leave any questions in the comments and thank you for watching.